Hey, welcome back, fellowship family and friends. Hey, we've been going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, and today we've made our way into uh, time out. Let's go back. Here we go. This is take number two, final take, uh, for Sunday, March the 20th. Hey, welcome back, fellowship. <laughs> take number three. Here we go. A lot to cover. Uh, March the 20th. Here we go. Final take. Hey, welcome in to all of our fellowship family and friends. Well, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. We've been going verse by verse, and today we're in chapter number 13. We're actually going to start in verse number 19 of this chapter, talking about how the earth is going to be reconfigured. Yeah, I know you want to join in. You're going to want to invite some friends, pass it along, because we're going to dive deep into some future conversation. So if you're new to the fellowship, I'm so glad that you're here. And I pray that you have an appetite for the study of the scriptures. That's what we're going to do today. So grab your Bible, a way to take notes. We got a lot to cover. So let's get started. I'm so glad you're here. So welcome in. All right. Well, we have had an incredible morning of worship today and now... I just want to remind you, we're going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter number 13. We're going to be looking at verse number 19 and 20 today. Let me bring you up to speed. If you're new to uh, the fellowship or new to this study, uh, Jesus is in the final week of his life. He has spent Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in the temple, uh, the temple courtyard teaching. Thousands of people have come to Jerusalem because it's the Passover weekend. Uh, on Wednesday, he's in the courtyard teaching when he's approached by the Pharisees four times. They're pressing in on him, hoping to trap him, hoping that they can get him arrested either with the Roman guards or that the Jewish people would just turn on him. They, they despise him. So Jesus has had a long day teaching. And as they're leaving on Wednesday afternoon, he and the disciples begin walking away from the temple proper there in uh, Jerusalem. And one of the disciples remarks to Jesus and says something like, isn't this just beautiful? Talking about the splendor of the buildings that have been erected there uh, as the Temple Mount. We know that it took about 50 years for it to all be built. And so these people, these disciples, it was in their lifetime. They're watching this happen. Their, their parents watched it happen. And now they're looking at the grand building that has been uh, structured there. And all the thousands of people that have gathered there, it, it's, it's probably, as I've said in the past, about 15 football fields in size. So that helps you to understand how large this is. And as they walk away, Jesus says something very interesting to the disciples when they're commenting on how spectacular it is. He says something like this. You're right, guys. It is spectacular but I can tell you it's going to be destroyed, at which the disciples kind of take a step back and pause, and they're like, what does that mean? It's going to be destroyed. It just, they just finished building it. It's, it's, it took them 50 years, five decades to build this, and now it's going to be destroyed. Well, that's where we're going to pick up in chapter 13. So they leave uh, Jerusalem. They walk through the valley. It's probably about a 10 or 15-minute walk. They go over to the Mount of Olives, and man, they are in direct line of being able to see Temple Mount. I mean, it's beautiful. Lit up at night. It's extraordinary. And there he's sitting with the disciples on the Mount of Olives, and he begins to instruct them. Now, in Mark chapter 13, the first 13 verses are all about the time of Jesus up until present day. So that's really what those 13 verses cover. And then we talked about the little white space between 13 and 14, the rapture. We've talked about that. And then we process through into verses 14. We talked about it last week. And now we're going to come in to verse number 19. And it's very interesting. And, I, and I've got something here to remind us of this because this is a period of time called the tribulation. It's going to last for seven years. And in the tribulation is going to be three ways for us to think about the way that it's described in the scriptures, there's three events that happen or three kind of cataclysmic events that happen during the tribulation. And, and this isn't all that happens in the tribulation, but this will help you to, to process. First of all, we're going to look at, there were um, seven scrolls that were opened. So this represents our scroll. 
there's seven trumpets that are going to get uh, blasted, and then there's seven bowls that are going to be poured out. Now, all of these are representing God's judgment. There's going to be seven in each category. They're going to break the seal of the scroll, read it, and it's going to be proclaiming God's judgment. They're going to blow, an angel's going to blow a trumpet, proclaiming God's judgment. There's going to be an angel that's going to pour out God's judgment onto the earth. So that gives you visually what we're talking about today. So there's three different parts of the tribulation that we're looking at today. And I can just tell you, we have a lot of ground to cover. So I need you to have big ears, have your pen or your phone or some way to take notes handy, be ready to go because we're going to jump into the deep end looking at each of these three. We know that in chapter 6 he talks about this, and then he starts into chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10 about the trumpets, and then in chapter 16 he wraps up with the bowl judgments. So I want to give you some, um, some ways to think about this as we go into, because we're going to look at verses 19 and 20 and then jump into the book of Revelation. So I want to remind you of a couple of things. When you're studying the Bible, it's very important that you recognize that there are different forms of literature. So like in the Bible, there is poem literature. There's songs that have been written, S-O-N-G, songs that have been written. There is, um, there is narrative writing. That's stories being told, like gospels. The writing that we're going to look at today is called apocalyptic writing or apocalyptic literature. And it's, it, you really find most apocalyptic uh, literature in the book of Daniel, a little bit in the book of Ezekiel, and then a whole lot of it in the book of Revelation, which we'll be looking at today. And so as we go through this, know that we're looking at apocalyptical literature. And, and another way maybe for you to think about this, if you're familiar with maybe the way a newspaper is printed, the front page of a newspaper is going to have kind of your splash page with all of the major things that are happening, kind of the headline news with very little commentary. It's just kind of giving the facts so to speak. Uh, find a newspaper you can trust, that would be good. But it's going to give the facts, and then as you turn the page, you start to see editorial comments. So it's different types of writing. So on the front page, you've got, um, you've got information. Then you start to get commentary or editorial revisions as you go. Then you're going to see a sports page, and then maybe if they still have it in the paper, they're going to have a funny paper, a uh, funny section. So it's different ways of different writing in a newspaper. Well, that's how the Word of God is set up. There's different writings that help us to understand this. So apocalyptic writing literature is a lot about imagery, a lot about helping us to see visually with our minds and capture what is being talked about from the writer um, as he gives visuals. So I also want to caution us as we go into the book of Revelation today that we kind, of, we kind of approach the scriptures with a Western mindset. Sometimes we read the scriptures thinking from a Western mind frame, um, a frame of mind. And so I want to caution us against that today. We're going to read this. I'm going to make some commentary on it. And then we're going to keep moving. But, but I also want to make sure that we understand that we're also linear thinkers. In other words, we think from beginning to end. So when we read the scriptures, we're kind of reading it. Sometimes we think, well, we're reading it in chronological order. Well, that's not necessarily uh, the way that the Bible is written. But we have a tendency to think, I'm going to read chapter 4, and then I'm going to turn the page read chapter 5. It's linear thinking. There's a beginning, there's an end. What you need to know about apocalyptic writing and literature and what the vision that we're going to talk about today is that God isn't, isn't confined to the same ways we think linear. He, he can do it very differently, and I think we're going to see that in here because God's going to use a way to describe this. And, and as I was preparing for today, the best way I could think of it was maybe like a vortex, kind of like, um, or, or maybe a tornado. You get this spinning motion, so the vortex is something around matter, so you get these, um, these gases and liquid that revolve around the vortex, what's in the center, that's how you're going to see this writing. We're going to see a description of the tribulation today. That's a seven-year period of time after the rapture. So the church will be gone, and all those who are left behind are going to go through a period of time for seven years called the tribulation. So 
rather than think of it in a linear sense, because it's going to be three different events that happen, but they're, but they're going to be kind of swirling together. That's the best way I can describe it. There's going to be some overlap of them, and I think it'll make sense as we go through it. Now, let me also say this. We can't cover everything on a Sunday morning, but what we can cover is going to help you in your personal study and your information for end times. If you're looking for a really good trusted source, um, online crew, if you're looking for a great trusted source, Dr. Ed Heinson, H-I-N-D-S-O-N, is a source that I use. Dr. Heinson was one of my seminary professors. He is brilliant when it comes to end times. I promise you, if you'll Google Dr. Ed Heinsen, uh, you will find all kinds of incredible self-help on this topic of end time. So again, you got to know who you're, t- who you're listening to because remember what Jesus said, in the end times, there will be a lot of false prophets. There's going to be a lot of people coming along teaching false doctrine. So you don't want to get captured and get enamored with somebody that's not teaching accurately the Word of God. I can tell you, I would trust Dr. Ed Heinsen. There's others I would trust but he certainly is one of the best out there that I would encourage you to check out. Now, all of this begs the question, when's it going to happen? Well, we don't know the exact date. We're told in scriptures, don't even try to calculate the date and time. It's not worth our time. People have tried it. It doesn't work. Here's what we do know. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, look at it with me. Chapter 24 and verse 14, the scriptures say, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So in other words, the end will come, the end of this world will come, once God determines, okay, the last person on earth that needed to hear the gospel has heard the gospel, and now we can start the process of end times. And the first thing is going to be, boom, the rapture. In the twinkling of an eye, the scriptures say, I mean, it's going to catch us off guard, What if it happened while I'm in the middle of preaching today? And all of a sudden, we go from here to a glorified scent. And I mean, we don't even have time to transition. It just happens that quickly. Well, after that, there's going to be a period of time called the tribulation. Here we go. So Mark's gospel, chapter number 13, starting in verse number 19. For there will be greater anguish in those days talking about the tribulation than at any time since God created the world. Now, you got to be alert right here. So since God created the world, there's never been a time like what he's about to describe. It will never be seen, again, quite like this. It's never going to be as great as what we're about to see in the way Jesus describes this. In fact, unless the Lord shortens the time of calamity, not a single person will survive But for the sake of his chosen ones, he has shortened those days. So let me give you some insight here because we're going to jump from verse 20 into the book of Revelation. Jesus is talking about the catalytic catalytic movement of the rapture happens, the saints, the church are gone, and it's going to usher in this really difficult time. Seven years called the tribulation. And during this time, God's going to pour out judgments. He's going to pour out his wrath on this earth. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a flyover. We're not going to dive deep into all of these because there's so much ground to cover. But I want to make sure that we cover it today because it's going to stay with the integrity of Mark chapter 13, 19, and 20. So you ready to go? All right, here we go. you got to be ready because we're going to look at a lot of passages of Scripture We're going to begin in Revelation chapter 1 so that we can set the table. Listen to what the first two verses, first three verses of Revelation 1 says. It said, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the events that must take place. Talking about the seven years of tribulation and some other events. So he sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything that he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses. I want you to hear this, church. Online crew, I want you to hear this. God blesses 
the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. So I get a blessing for reading this today. But also he blesses all who listen to his message and obey what it says, for the time is near. So this is how God introduces the book of the Revelation. So what is happening is God, John tells us in verse 19 of chapter 1 that it's like he felt dead. He was on the island of Patmos by himself, and all of a sudden, in the, maybe the best way we could describe it, it's like he went into a trance. He described it like, I was dead, but I could see, I could communicate. So he's like he's in this trance, and God is going to reveal to him this vision, this revelation, and says to him, I want you to write down everything for future generations to know this. And as he's already said, so that we'll be blessed. Now, what we're going to look at is not the entire vision. We're only going to look at the part that is the three judgments of the tribulation today. The seal judgment, um, the trumpet judgments, and the bold judgment. So, it starts in chapter 6. We begin to see this is in the tribulation. Church is gone. The Antichrist has showed up. And here we go, chapter 6. As I watched, talking John, it's John talking about what he's observing. He's in this trance, he's being moved around by an angel of God showing him a message from Jesus. He says, as I watched, the lamb broke the seven seals on the scroll. Or he broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. The lamb is a reference to Jesus. So Jesus would have broken the seal on the scroll. Then I heard one of a, the four living beings, these are angels from heaven, say with a voice like thunder, Come! I looked up and I saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. This is a reference to that there is going to be an establishment in the tribulation of a one world government, a one world leader that we commonly refer to as the Antichrist or the Antichrist. So he is, he is everything anti-Jesus. And the world is going to enjoy that they've got this one leader because they're going to see a different level of prosperity and a unification of the world that they've not seen quite like what they're about to see. Verse 3, when the Lamb broke the second seal, so now there's a second scroll, there's going to be seven of these. So he broke up in the first one and talks about there's going to be one world order, one world government, one world leader. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, come. Then another horse appeared. This was a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take place from the earth, to take peace from the earth, and there was war and slaughter everywhere. So he was able to take peace out and bring hostility. And Jesus said that the closer we get, when you go back and look what we've talked about over the last few weeks, the closer we get to the end times, there's going to be an increase in wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be an increase in earthquakes. There's going to be an increase in famines. And there's going to be people giving their life in faith to Jesus. And so here we go in the second scroll that is open, and he begins to talk about how intense and frequent wars are now going to start happening. What everybody thought would be this peaceful world leader, he now ushers in a tremendous amount of hostility. Red, by the way, represents war and blood. And so the more wars you have, guess what happens? When you have wars, famine and death ensue. Listen to the third seal. When the lamb broke the third seal, verse 5 of chapter 6, I heard the living being saying, come. I looked up, I saw a black horse this time. So he saw a white one, a red one, now a black one. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. When I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, a loaf of bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. And hey, by the way, don't waste the olive oil and wine. In other words, what the scroll, scrolls are representing, or the scales are representing are that there is going to be a uh, hyperinflation and scales are going to be needed to weigh out the cost of goods. And, the, and John is saying, 
Man, I saw a loaf of bread cost an entire day's wage. So don't go wasting your oil. Three things of barley are going to cost you an entire day of work. Can you imagine going to the grocery store and it takes an entire day's wage to pay for a loaf of bread? So talk about hyperinflation. It's going to come and things are going to get more expensive because there's going to be more wars. And because of hyperinflation, you're going to start to see famine taking place here on the planet. All of this happens in the seven-year tribulation. Now, we're only talking about the first half of the tribulation right now. Okay? Then there was a fourth scroll. And the seal was broken on the fourth one. And I heard the, the fourth living being saying, come. I looked up. I saw a horse whose color was pale green. So a different color. Its rider was named Death. And his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. Now, it's a very interesting statement. If you took our world population, and again, I'm not taking into account how many believers will be raptured, but right now we're at about 7.9% billion people living on the planet. I'm just going to round it up to 8 billion people for sake of number, but it's actually about 7.9 billion today. So if there's 8 billion people on the planet, and again, we're not taking into account how many people are lifted out of here at the rapture, um, but I'm just going to use this number of 8 million. A fourth of the population are going to be killed. That's 2 billion people are going to get killed in this first part of the tribulation according to this judgment. I mean, think of the challenges associated with two billion people all dying within a matter of just a few weeks or months of each other. And the tribulation, my friend, is just getting started. The fifth seal is broken on a scroll. Verse 9 says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. So this is talking about people that are followers of God, followers of Christ. Now you might go, well, wait a minute, I thought they were all raptured out. Well, there is going to be people, and it's going to be very different because there's going to be the removal of the church. The Holy Spirit's not going to be at work here. This is now the devil's playground. So to come to faith in God is going to require an intense amount of faith. In fact, as you look through the bold judgments, you most likely will be martyred, and we're going to talk about that as we go through this. So at the moment of the rapture, everybody is taken to heaven. So the ability to have the influence of other witnesses on this planet, they're going to be gone. So it's going to be so difficult, but there will be some that will get saved. So we go into the sixth seal. I watched as the lamb broke the sixth seal. This is verse number 12. And there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth. The moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky, they fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll and all the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and every free person. They all hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the face of the one, talking about God, hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, Jesus. People are going to want to die. It's so horrible during this time. They are going to want to die. And the earth, as we see, is now beginning to be stressed and torn apart. Did you hear what it said? Even uh, the mountains and the rocks, there's going to be things dislodged from their normal place. The islands are moved. Mountains are moved. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. This is getting crazy. Then there is another seal. It's the seventh one. We have to actually go to chapter 8 of Revelation for this one. Verse 1, and when the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. 
Now, I got to thinking about this. Why? Why was there silence in heaven? And again, I'm not exactly positive, but I'm going to take the most educated guess at this that I can based on study of Scripture. I think those in heaven are stunned at what they've just witnessed. The church has been raptured, and now God is pouring out His wrath, and they are in shock, in awe of what He has done. They are stunned. And yet, the most difficult days haven't even started yet. Because it's in the second three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. The second half is called the Great Tribulation. This is when it gets really, really difficult. Not to say it's not difficult already. Can you imagine first writer John trying to describe all of this? I mean, we've got modern technology now. We've got movies. We've got books that have been written. We've got imagery that help us to capture what he's talking about. But John is seeing this in the trance and he's got the angel directing him through this and he's getting a word from Jesus himself and he's recording everything that he sees. Imagine how generations before movies and motion pictures came into play where you could see this kind of imagery. How they're trying to process Revelation chapter 6 and the seven seals that have been broken. Well, when you move from the seven seals, the next phase starts into the next three and a half years, and it's the seven trumpets. It's a time of great judgment. It's called the seven trumpets judgment. In Revelation chapter 8, verse number 2, I saw the seven angels who stand before God. Now, there's a whole message right there. We're going to just kind of pass over it. But really good insight on that one right there. I saw the seven angels who stand before God. They were given seven trumpets. This is similar to what a trumpet would have looked like. Uh, They were given seven trumpets. Then another angel um, with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down to the earth. And thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. So seven angels standing before God as all of this starts to unfold. And now we're hearing a description of a global storm taking place. We've never never encountered that before. We've never seen that. Now the days of Noah would have seen a global flood, but we've never seen a global storm followed by what John is describing as a great earthquake. We just never had this before. So the world is now in worldwide disaster. Three and a half years in to the tribulation, the church is gone. And now he starts into the trumpets, the first trumpet. The angel blew his trumpet. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. When the angel blew his trumpet, hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire. A third of the earth. Church, I mean, this is devastating. One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned and all of the green grass was burned. Imagine a third of our planet's vegetation gone in an instant. Imagine the impact it would have on the ecosystem. Hail and fire mixed with blood thrown down. One possibility here is that this great, earth, this great earthquake that precedes this, I mean, if you think about it from a scientific point of view, think about the instability it would create globally to have a great earthquake. Think about the volcanoes that might erupt as a result of it or the tsunamis that could come as a result of a great earthquake. Imagine the the gases and the lava that are shot up into the air. Perhaps this is even describing, maybe there was livestock from volcanoes shot up into the air, which would help us to understand that a little bit more. It's, It's being showered down on the earth, and it's not good. But then there was a second trumpet. The second angel, and all of this is going to happen in the tribulation, a second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One-third of the water in the sea became blood. One-third of all, living, of all things living in the sea died. And one-third of the ships on the sea were destroyed. 
So a great mountain of fire, what could that possibly be? Well, maybe it's a meteor, maybe it's an asteroid that's a, a fireball that hits the earth. Maybe that's our best way to describe this. I, I don't know if you'll remember back in 2015, there was an asteroid uh, that kind of came on the radar blip very quickly. It was called TB-145. They, because it was around Halloween, they actually called it uh, the Great Pumpkin. It hurled by, now you got to understand, this was 1,300 feet wide ball of fire. It went by the planet, by our planet, at the speed of 22 miles a second. 22 miles every second. That would be 78,000, uh, 78,300 miles per hour. I mean, it's moving faster than a jet, and this this ball of fire rockets right by our planet. That was in 2015. Suppose that 1,300 wide meteor ball of fire hit this planet. Just say, suppose it hit, by the way, the New York Times, USA Today, Fox News, all did a piece on this back in 2015. What if it had hit in the Atlantic Ocean? You would have seen swells, waves, uh, tidal waves that were 200 feet high slam the East Coast, Imagine the devastation it would have brought to cities like Miami, Charleston, Washington, D.C., New York City, Boston, completely devastating. And so this uh, second trumpet that is blown talks about something like this is going to happen in the tribulation. But then there's a third trumpet. The angel blows the trumpet, the third trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness. By the way, if you look at some other translations, you might see the word wormwood. The name of it was wormwood. The actual translation there is hemlock. Well, when you do a little bit of research on this, hemlock is actually a poison. And so... One third of the water became bitter and many people died from drinking the bitter water. So the first, uh, when the second trumpet blew, there was this huge fireball that hits the earth. Now there's another one, a star falls from the sky and we see that it's named wormwood or bitterness and it hits the natural springs. It hits the rivers. It hits the clean water. That's where we get our drinking water from. Imagine the devastation now that water is bitter and maybe even poisonous because it says a whole lot of people died as a result of drinking the water. It's not good, is it, friends? The tribulation is not a time you want to be here. Well, there was a fourth trumpet. The fourth angel blew his trumpet. One third of the sun was struck, one third of the moon and one third of the stars, and they all became dark. One third of the day was dark and also one third of the night. Now, <clears throat> we don't know what the result of this is, but could it be that it's maybe a meteor again, an asteroid that hits the planet, sending volcanic ash into the atmosphere, darkening it? Don't know, but that's one plausible way to explain this. Only God knows. But these explosions from a volcano eruption, we already know in 1815 there was one. It was so severe, I talked about it a few weeks ago in Indonesia, that even the Western Hemisphere, like the United States, experienced severe famine for an entire half of a season because the ground was frozen for weeks upon weeks in June, uh, or in May and June, going into July. Imagine if the sun is blocked for a third of the day. Imagine the impact that has on the warmth of our planet. No longer that heat generating. What it might look like. It's possible that the seasons could begin to change because the seasons that we know would be completely disrupted if a third of the sunshine was gone. Now our seasons completely change. And talk about something that is devastating. Well, then I looked, because things are going to get worse. Verse 13 of chapter 8, And John said, I looked, and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, and it was crying, Terror, 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 
to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. So now there's another warning saying, get ready. You think it's gotten bad? Get ready because another trumpet's about to blow and it's going to get even worse. The fifth angel. In chapter 9, we see the fifth angel blowing his trumpet. Verse 1, I saw a star that had fallen to the earth from the sky. By the way, most theologians believe that this star that falls is actually Satan. That it's actually him that is being hurled back to the earth. He was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Now, the bottomless pit, according to Scripture, is a place where maybe the worst of the worst of the demons are. And now this fallen star has been given a key to unlock the bottomless pit and release them. Verse 2, And when he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace. And John's trying to describe what he's witnessing. And the sunlight in the air, it turned dark from the smoke. It was so smoky when the bottomless pit was open that it blocked out the sunlight. Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth and they were given power to sting like scorpions. I mean, we've already got one-fourth of the population has already been killed. So we're, we're down to six billion, not counting those who were raptured. And now the people that are left behind are going to start getting stung like it's being stung from a scorpion. Verse 4, they were told not to harm the grass, talking about these locusts. They're told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They'll long to die, but death will flee from them. So in other words, there's going to be a brief time in this second three and a half years during the tribulation where not even death will take somebody. Death is like death's going to take a vacation for five months. And it's just going to, these demons are going to wreak havoc on this planet. Then there was the sixth trumpet. Verse 13, the sixth trumpet blew. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month they, and year, and they were turned loose to kill one-third of the people on earth. So if we started with eight million or eight billion, and a fourth of those were killed, leaving us with six billion, again, not including those in the tribulation, and now a third of those are going to be killed. That's two billion more of the six. That's a lot of people have died. It's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five billion people will have died in a matter of just a few months or years. Can you imagine with all of this disaster going all over the planet, the chaos, the demons that have been let loose, the fireballs hitting the planet, and lots of dead bodies and not enough time to bury them all. Imagine the sanitation problems. Verse 16, I also heard the size of the army, which was 200 million mounted troops. Now you're starting to see the formation. The enemy begins to form an army, getting ready for a battle. Then the seventh trumpet blows. This is found in chapter 11 and verse number 15. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices shouting in heaven. The world has now, come, now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened, and the ark of the covenant could be seen inside the temple. Then lightning flashed, thunder crashed and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. So we see the second time that there is a global storm hitting the planet and another earthquake. I mean, literally the earth is just being torn apart. And I know 
Some of you may be thinking, you know, I've heard people say, you know, I'll just, I'm not going to follow Jesus, I'll just take my chances. Friend, I'm telling you, don't take your chances and end up in the tribulation. It won't be worth it. This is going to be a horrible time. And all I'm doing is just reading the scriptures and God said we'll be blessed for doing so. So someone may hear this, pe- this message today. It could be a, someone from our online audience or you're here in the room and say, Pastor, you're really scaring me. Listen, when we read the scriptures and Jesus is defining for us what this horrible time looks like on the earth, it can be very scary. Now, for those of us that are believers, we've got the hope and the knowledge of knowing we will be raptured and we won't be a part of this. But it becomes scary for us to think that there will be family members or friends or acquaintances or co-workers or classmates or teammates that haven't followed him in, in faith. They very well could be a part of this, and I don't like that. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm sounding the alarm today because I love you and I care about you. If you're watching online, I love and care for you, and I'm sounding the alarm. I, think of it this way. Imagine, because behind us is our kids' ministry, imagine in the middle of my, of my sermon today, an infant gets out of one of the rooms, and, a, and one of our extraordinary leaders doesn't catch it, and, and the baby crawls through and comes under the black curtain and works his way, and I'm, I'm just preaching up a storm, And everybody in the room, all of you see the baby coming because when you drop off the front of this platform, there's a little bit of a drop off. And you know that if that baby comes to the edge and falls over, it could harm itself. I wonder, would you just remain silent like, oh no, I don't want to interrupt. I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to embarrass the pastor. I don't want to, I don't want to draw attention to myself. I don't think so. I think there would be some of you if that baby was coming here, if some of you if that baby was coming here, you would either jump up, you would disrupt the service, you would holler out, hey, stop that baby, somebody help that baby. Well, that's all we're doing today. Friends, we need to warn our friends and family members of the coming judgment that will be poured out on this earth. God's wrath will be poured out. Why? Because He gave His only Son. He died in our place so that we could be back in right standing. But those who mock and reject Him, God is not going to shine favorably on that. And that's what we're seeing. Then, we've had the the seven seals broken, seven trumpets have been blasted, and then there's seven bowl judgments. These are found in Revelation chapter 16. Then I heard a mighty voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. So the first angel left the temple and poured out his bowl on the earth. And horrible, malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. So with all of the destruction, with all of the death, now the wrath of these horrible sores for all of those who are still here that have taken the mark of the beast. Then there's a second bowl, verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and the sea became like blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. Imagine the smell that that must have created. The rotting, smelling water, as if, like John is describing, like that of a dead corpse. Pretty gross. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs, and they became blood. And here we are again, the rivers and springs, the place that we get our clean, fresh drinking water. You, you, you may be thinking right now, come on, Pastor David, how could a loving God do such horrible things? Well, the angels address this in verse number five. Here's what the angels in heaven said. And, when, and, and I heard an angel who had authority over all water saying, interesting, that there was an angel assigned to a supervisory role over water on the earth. Pretty interesting thought. So this angel who had authority over all the water said, you are just, speaking to God, God, you are just, O Holy One, 
who is and who is always was, because you have sent these judgments. Since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is their just reward. In other words, the angel is saying, we have watched through the corridor of time, the saints of old, be martyred, be persecuted, your prophets killed, including your son. This is a just reward. And they know what Jesus had gone through. They've watched the saints that have been mistreated and beaten and killed for their faith. And the angels see this as a just reward or a just justice for all of this inhumane behavior. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat and they cursed the name of God who had control all of, over all of these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and they did not turn to God and give Him glory. Imagine the sun, because we just talked about it during the trumpet um, judgments, that the sun will be blocked a third of it and how that would change the climate. Well, now you're seeing when the bold judgment is poured out, uh, this fourth bold judgment, that the sun is actually increases its heat and sends out a blast of heat that burns people. It scorches people is what the Word of God says. Now imagine the sun scorching the planet with so much heat. Imagine what that would do to our ice caps. Again, scientifically, if, our, if the sun was hot enough to melt those ice caps that quickly, it's said scientifically that the earth would then, uh, the seas would swell by 200 feet. In other words, the east coast of the United States, gone, underwater, 200 feet of water. Hawaii, gone. The Caribbean, gone. Imagine the cities that are coastal. I began thinking about New York and L.A., Houston off of the Gulf of Mexico, London, Tokyo, Mumbai, Shanghai, Lagos, Calcutta, Lima, Miami. I mean, these are millions and millions of people in these mega cities that are all coastal, and now there's a 200, rise, 200 foot rise in water elevation because of the heat of the sun, you wouldn't even recognize this planet. It, it would look completely different. In fact, God begins to do that. Bowl number five, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish and they cursed the God of heaven and their pains and, for their pains and sores, but they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They know who's doing this. They know this is coming from God, people do, and yet they still harden their heart against Him. They still are defiant against their Creator. They rebel against Him and they begin to curse Him. So God brings a sixth bowl. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River. It dried up so that the kings from the east could march their armies toward the west without a hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouths of the dragon. The dragon is a reference to Satan. So a frog that leaps from the mouth of the dragon. One that leaps from the mouth of the beast. That's the Antichrist. And the false prophet, this would have been like, uh, best way to describe it, maybe the assistant to the Antichrist. This would have been the, the person that's um, kind of like their spokesperson for the Antichrist. Verse 14 says, They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to all the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord in the great judgment day of God the Almighty. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. Now this might be a familiar word to you. The battle of Armageddon. And a lot takes place before the battle of Armageddon. But it says that the armies of the world are going to assemble. The enemy, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they're going to assemble this massive army to go to battle with God in the valley of of Megiddo, that's in the northern part of Israel. Then there's a seventh bowl judgment. In the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air and a mighty shout from the throne in the temple saying, it is finished! 
Then the thunder crashed and rolled and lightning flashed. It's another global storm. And then a great earthquake struck. Listen to this. The worst earthquake since people were placed on the earth. I mean, this earthquake is different. I mean, there's been lots of earthquakes, but now this one, something's different about it. Never has there been an earthquake quite like this. Verse 20. And every island disappeared. All the mountains leveled. There was a terrible hailstorm. The hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the people below. They cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstorm. I mean, imagine no longer having the mountain ranges. The Andes and the Rockies, they're gone. They are flattened because of this earthquake and storm. The Himalayans and the Hindu Kush, massive mountain ranges. Gone, leveled. The earth is literally reconfigured by God through the tribulation. Now, I want to bring this to a close. All of this happens in preparation for the coming King. Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, He is about to have His second coming. You go, well, I thought He came during the rapture. No, Jesus came, born of a virgin, lived among men, died on a cross, ascended back to heaven. But when the rapture took place, He didn't come back and touch down. The rapture was he suspended, if you will, in the sky and he sweeps away an incredible rescue mission. He sweeps away the church, but now he's coming again and it's called the second coming of Christ. You say, well, what will that be like, man? That's going to be, that's going to be pretty sweet. I mean, now this battle is ensuing in the valley of Megiddo. Well, come next week. We'll talk about the second coming of Christ. So what do we do with today? I'm telling you, friend, be ready. If you've not given your life in faith to Jesus, you need to do that today. Get ready. He could come back at any moment, triggering these events to start. You want to be saved. You want to be ready for His return. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is who He says He is and confess Him as your Lord. Give your life in faith to Jesus. But I would also say, friend, if you're already a believer, then live right. Be holy in your actions, in your words, in the way you live. Be ready for His return, and let's get people ready. That's really what I wanted to talk about with you today. Let's get people ready for the return of Christ so that as many of our friends and family would have, would have the opportunity to avoid such a horrible seven years of tribulation. The rapture of the church is going to happen when we least expect it. And then the tribulation starts. But friend, come back next week because we're going to talk about Jesus is coming back, the second coming. Let me pray for us. Father, right now, for any person online or in this room that does not know you, I pray they come to know you. Would they admit that, I pray they would admit that they're a sinner. Right now, confess, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I believe you died on a cross. Jesus, I believe you rose again. And by faith, I trust you and I live for you today. May they confess you now. In Jesus' name, amen. I can tell you, if that's you today and you're giving your life and faith to Jesus, you need to let us know. Write it on a connection card. If you're online, send us a note. Let us know you're giving your life and faith to Jesus. And we want to help you to take your next step. We're going to be baptizing Easter Sunday. Hey, we're going to be baptizing Easter Sunday, so get ready. Well, thanks for being a part of the Bible study today. I love you. It's a lot of information, but we need to know, and we're blessed by reading it, and we're blessed by hearing and obeying it. So church, I love you. I'm so glad that we could talk about this today. Amen. Wow, we covered a lot of information today from the book of Revelation. I pray you were able to keep up. If you missed something, just go back, listen to it again. Uh, grab your phone, maybe take a screenshot, etc. I just want to remind you, Jesus, he, he loves you. He loves you so much, he died for you. And God's expectation of us is we are his creation and he wants us to follow his plan and his plan is through Jesus. So today, if you're giving your life and faith to Jesus, I pray you'd let us know. 
Uh, we'd love for you to be baptized, or if you're not in our area, we want to connect you to a great Bible teaching church uh, like the Fellowship, and so we can help you with that. But I just want to say to you, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being a part of this, and let's let God shape us. Looking at the book of Revelation can be exciting for some and scary for others, and some just won't believe it. Here's what I can tell you. I believe this book. I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I believe he's coming again. I believe he's going to rapture the church, and I believe there's going to be a real, literal tribulation. And so he's been patient with us, but at some point, the last person's going to hear the gospel, and the rapture's going to happen. And so, church, I want you to be ready. Friends, I want you to be ready. I love you. I thank God for you. I pray you'll come back next week because we're going to look at the exciting event called the second coming. So I'll see you. Have a great week. I love you. And more importantly, God loves you.